from the spinal cord, they very quickly anastomose to become spinal nerves. All spinal nerves are mixed, meaning they carry both motor and sensory information. And the, region, the reason that this is possible is because of the connective tissue that provides insulation for the neurons in the spinal cord along with, of course, the presence of the myelin sheath that also insulates the axons and helps to speed along nerve transmission. Okay, So this is why we can carry information in two directions. And you can see some of the targets as well, right? You can see um, visceral and somatic sensory coming in via the dorsal root, past the dorsal root ganglion. Visceral sensory is always going to be um, on the on the medial aspect of the dorsal root, okay? While somatosensory input is going to be on the more superficial or lateral portion of the dorsal root, if you like, okay? And the same is true with visceral and somatic motor. Somatic motor is going to be more anterior. Visceral motor is going to be more posterior on the ventral root. Spinal white matter contains ascending and descending tracts of white matter that contain axons of neurons that travel to and from the brain. This allows the spinal cord to fulfill its primary function as a relay station. It's organized into general regions called the fununculi. There are three total fununculi, the posterior fununculus, the lateral, and the anterior fununculus, and they lie on each side of the spinal cord. Their features include white matter organized into tracts or columns that are bilaterally symmetrical, meaning that the left and right side of the body have identical tracts serving their respective sides of the body. Ascending and descending tracts bring information to and from a specific region of the brain, while sensory pathways travel in the posterior and lateral fununculi, and motor pathways travel in the anterior and lateral fununculi. Okay? So this kind of makes sense, right? That we have uh, motor in the front and on the sides and sensory in the back and on the sides. And <clears throat> if you think about the dorsal and ventral roots and their, the, the direction and the type of information they carry, this makes sense, right? Ventral root is motor outputs, efferent information. Dorsal root is sensory inputs, afferent information. Okay, um, this is just a, another view of a transverse section of the spinal cord. And what we've done here is outline some of the descending tracts. So this is going to bring information down from the brain and brainstem and ultimately deliver it to efferent neurons that will carry it to their targets. So these descending tracts transmit motor information from specific regions in the brain down to the spinal cord to specific regions in the body. Examples of these tracts include the corticospinal tracts, which are the largest of the descending tracts and help control skeletal muscles below the head and neck. They originate from motor areas of the cerebral cortex and they descend as part of the internal capsule, then decussate within the brainstem. Remember, that's crossing from left to right and right to left. Then travel through the lateral funiculi of the spinal cord the fibers deliver the motor information to the appropriate locations in the anterior horn. Okay, those are going to be the uh, areas of gray matter in the ventral side of the spinal cord. Okay, now there are other tracts. Okay, aside from the corticospinal tract, and you'll notice again that these are all descending tracts, so they're all bringing information down from the brain and brainstem to their appropriate targets in the efferent neurons, but they carry different flavors of information. The reticulospinal tract, for instance, carries motor information 
from the brain stem that's critical in the maintenance of posture and the proper orientation of the body and limbs during movement. And you can see those areas here, the little areas indicated in purple. The tectospinal tract carries motor information from the superior colliculus of the brain stem. Remember that that is uh, on the back side of the midbrain. And it's important for reflexive movement of the head and the eyes. And the vestibulospinal tract carries motor information from the vestibular nuclei in the brain stem, which is important in the maintenance of posture and balance. Okay, So you can see where all those... And again, notice the general location, right? Anterior and lateral. Okay, So you could think of these like little elevators that only carry certain passengers in a certain direction. The other thing to notice about the naming of these tracks is that they're always named according to where they start in the first part of the term of the tract and where they end in the last part of the term of the tract. So, for instance, the corticospinal tract is going to begin in the cerebral cortex and is going to end where? In the spinal cord. Okay. The tectospinal tract is going to begin in the tectum of the brain stem and is going to descend to the spinal cord. Okay, we next want to touch on the role of the central nervous system in sensation. So this would be afferent information coming into the CNS from initially sensory receptors, then sensory neurons, which would then pipe the information into the dorsal root, past the dorsal root ganglion, and then we're officially in the central nervous system as we enter the spinal cord. Sensory stimuli are categorized as those effects that cause the senses to respond. Multiple sensory stimuli from different regions of the brain can be pulled together into a single mental picture. Each of these disparate stimuli reaches the brain in the following two-part process. The stimulus is detected by neurons in the peripheral nervous system and sent as sensory input to the central nervous system. Now this is important. The only thing that the nervous system understands is electrical information, and so these sensory neurons are designed to change physical changes into electrical information. And when we get to the structure of different sensory neurons, you'll see how they're adapted to change physical information into electrical information. In the central nervous system, the sensory input is sent to the cerebral cortex for interpretation. When the central nervous system has received all different sensory inputs, it integrates them into a single perception, which is a conscious awareness of sensation. These sensations can be grouped into two basic types. The special senses, which are detected by special sense organs, including vision, hearing, equilibrium, smell, and taste. And the general senses, which are detected by sensory neurons in the skin, the muscles, or the walls of organs and can be further subdivided into general somatic senses that involve the skin, the muscles, and joints, and the general visceral senses that involve the internal organs. Now, the special senses we are consciously aware of. That reaches our uh, cerebral cortex, and we're able to, um, first of all, um, have the perception of a stimulus, and then the sensation, okay, and then once we've taken that stimulus and we've labeled it as to what it is, we can integrate that with other sensory input and then send that to the area of the brain involved in planning and judgment and generate a plan of action based on these stimuli that are coming in. The general senses, the general somatic senses involving the skin, the muscles, and the joints, that generally reaches our conscious awareness. Um, the visceral senses will sometimes reach our conscious awareness, but mostly they'll be filtered out at the level of the thalamus, and most of this stuff will be acted on primarily by hypothalamic and brainstem function. The general somatic senses pertain to touch, stretch, joint position, pain, and temperature. There's two types of touch stimuli that are delivered to the appropriate part of the cerebral cortex by different pathways. The tactile senses, which are involved in fine discrimination and, um, and touch include things like vibration and two-point discrimination and light touch. Non-discriminative 
or crude touch lacks fine spatial resolution of the tactile senses. And we'll see when we look at the receptors that pick this up that their, their nerve endings have different adaptations for these different types of physical changes. Most of the general somatic senses are considered mechanical senses. Neurons that detect them are responsive to mechanical deformation and so they're termed mechanoreceptors. Two major ascending tracts in the spinal cord carry somatic sensory information to the brain. These include the posterior columns and the medial lemniscal system and the anterior lateral system. The basic pathway consists of first order neurons that detect the initial stimulus in the peripheral nervous system. The axon of this neuron then synapses onto a second order neuron which is an inner neuron located in the posterior horn of the spinal cord or brain stem and it relays the stimulus to a third order neuron which is an inner neuron found in the thalamus which then delivers the impulse to the cerebral cortex. Okay, so the bottom line here is that when we look at this diagram this is the information coming from the receptors located in the body wall, in the skin, etc. Okay, this is peripheral nerve tissue. Okay, this brings the information in to the central nervous system. Okay, we synapse here on a portion of the posterior horn. Okay, and then we have a neuron that's going to bring this information up, the second order neuron, all the way to the thalamus. Now remember that the thalamus is the brain's router among other things. Okay, it makes certain that stimuli coming up from the spinal cord hit the thalamus and the thalamus then routes them to the, direct, the correct area on the cerebral cortex. Once we're in the cerebral cortex we then are going to have the sensation of this stimulus and then we're going to label this stimulus. We'll have a perception of what it is um, that's where we apply meaning to the electrical information in the brain and then once we integrate all of these bits of sensory information and send them to the frontal lobe we generate a plan of action okay if this is stuff that's reaching our conscious awareness that is then sent via upper motor neurons down to the lower motor neurons which are going to exit the central nervous system via the ventral root and head all the way out to the effectors which could be muscles or glands and then we'll act on our stimulus. So here's a look at some of these pathways. Okay, Now I know these diagrams look a little confusing um, but the idea here is this is a schematic showing you how the information comes in from the outside and eventually gets routed up to the proper area in the brain where we can have sensation and then perception and then integration of these stimuli. So the posterior column medial lemniscal system includes axons of neurons that transmit tactile information including discriminative touch and axons that carry information regarding proprioception. They ascend through the posterior columns. The medial fasciculus gracilis carries impulses from the lower limbs and the fasciculus cuneatus carries impulses from the upper limbs, the trunk and the neck. The fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus axons then synapse with second order neurons when they enter the medulla, the nucleus gracilis and the nucleus cuneatus respectively. Axons of second order neurons decussate and form tracts called the medial lemniscus. The fibers from the medial lemniscus ascend through the pons in the midbrain until they reach third order neurons in the thalamus. Axons of these third order neurons then proceed all the way to the cerebral cortex. Okay, so again you have to understand how how to read this. Okay, so let's kind of trace it here. We'll do red since that'll probably show up nicer. So you've got you've got these first order neurons. Okay, these are sensory neurons they're going to bring the information in via the dorsal root, past the dorsal root ganglion, and into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Okay. Then 
let's use a different color that information is going to synapse onto a second order neuron okay so we'll use a different color here let's try let's try cyan I guess okay okay these first order neurons travel in the posterior columns so we're going to continue up so let's keep the color as red here okay so we're we're still a first order neuron at this point we're going to continue up heading up again this is all through these ascending tracks of white matter okay up we go up we go up we go okay and then we're going to hit these second order neurons you can see them right about here okay second order neurons in the medulla oblongata of the brain stem right now we can switch colors to something else okay so we head in again past the dorsal root ganglion via the dorsal root we hit the posterior horn of the spinal cord and then this is white matter okay remember white matter is for signal transmission and this is going to ascend all the way up to the medulla oblongata and we're going to decussate this is called the decussation of the pyramids and we're going to cross from right to left and left to right okay so we'll just follow this one pathway and then we're going to head up through the pons through the midbrain all the way up to the thalamus then we stop in the thalamus the brain's router okay and then a third order neuron is going to carry that information all the way to the appropriate area on the cerebral cortex let's use black for this okay and then we've hit our target okay they might say okay well, what happens next well first we have sensation then we have perception which is where we apply meaning to the stimulus meaning to the sensation and then we integrate with other stimuli And then all of that integrated information is going to head over to the frontal lobe. Where we will act on it somehow. Form a plan of action. The anterior lateral system is similar. This transmits information regarding pain, temperature, and non-discriminative touch in the anterior lateral spinal cord. The first order neurons synapse on second order neurons in the posterior horn. Then decussate. The spinal thalamic tract is the largest member of the anterior lateral system and it transmits signals through the spinal cord to the sensory relay nuclei of the thalamus and then the third order neurons in the thalamus transmit the impulses to the cerebral cortex okay so again um, let's use our color coding so we will start again with um, let's use red to start right so here comes our first order neuron this is a pain stimulus so you hit your finger with a pin okay first order neuron hits the dorsal horn going in through the dorsal root past the dorsal root ganglion and we synapse right here 
in the dorsal horn, and then we cross at that point, okay, and a second order neuron is going to carry the information up, okay, so we've, we've come in here and we've synapsed, and now a second order neuron is going to carry, the decussation happens at the level of the spinal cord, and then up we go, this is spinal thalamic tract, and then we're going to pass through the medulla oblongata, the pons in the midbrain, all the way up to the thalamus. Okay, so the crossing over in this particular ascending system is happening at the level of the spinal cord. Okay, and then third order neuron, which we'll do in black. Exits from the thalamus and carries this sensation to the appropriate area on the cerebral cortex. Okay, so one, two, and three, color-coded. The role of the cerebral cortex in sensation and somatotopy is critical, okay? Um, the thalamus relays most incoming information to the primary somatosensory cortex designated S1 in the postcentral gyrus, which is in the parietal lobe, okay? It's actually the anterior boundary of the parietal lobe. Each part of the body is represented by a specific region of S1, a type of organization called somatotopy. Mapping of the primary somatosensory cortex illustrates that different parts of the body are unequally represented. More S1 space is dedicated, for instance, to the hands and face, and this represents the importance of manual dexterity, facial expression, and speech to human existence. Unequal representation of the body parts in S1 is exemplified by the sensory homunculus who has his body parts in relationship to the area represented on the somatosensory cortex and he's pictured there in the lower right hand corner okay notice the large facial features and hands compared to the sensory input from the rest of the body okay now you might well ask how do we know this well, we know this in part from animal models, in part from direct experimentation by passing electrical currents through uh, the human brain for um, volunteer test subjects, and we also know a lot about the brain from individuals with brain damage. Okay, so this is something that we need to sometimes take with a bit of a grain of salt because it's oftentimes it's possible to overinterpret the meaning of information that you get from people with brain damage as it relates to the functioning of a healthy brain. Um, imagine, for instance, that uh, we were analyzing the important parts of a building, okay, and I pulled out the cornerstone of a building and the entire building fell over. I might over-conclude based on that that the cornerstone was responsible for the plumbing, the electricity, as well as the structural integrity of the entire building, when in fact it's simply a critical part of the infrastructure and the same is true for our information that comes from individuals with brain damage okay the role of the cerebral cortex in sensation as it relates to the processing of tactile stimuli the thalamic nuclei relay touch information from the spinal thalamic tracts in the posterior columns primarily to S1 for conscious perception once sensory information reaches S1, it is processed, perceived, and passed along to the cortical association areas. The somatosensory association cortex is what applies meaning to the sensation. It plays a major role in processing and sensory input and sending it to the limbic system, which is involved in tactile learning and memory, and is also what we would refer to as our emotional brain. It's what provides emotional content to the experiences around us. S1 also sends sensory input to the parietal and temporal association areas which integrate and relay information 
to the motor areas of the frontal lobe. How do we process pain stimuli? Well, perception of pain stimuli is termed nociception. The thalamus relays pain stimuli to several brain regions, including S1 and S2, where sensory discrimination, which is composed of the localization of the stimulus, the intensity of the stimulus, and the quality of the stimulus, is perceived and analyzed. It's also sent to the basal nuclei, regions of the limbic system, the hypothalamus, and the prefrontal cortex, where emotional and behavioral aspects of pain are processed. The cerebral cortex appears to have a significant influence on perception and modulation of pain. This is evident by a phenomenon called the placebo effect, where a dummy treatment with no pain-killing ingredients produces pain relief. A descending pathway originating mostly in S1, the amygdala, and a region of the midbrain called the periaqueductal gray matter provides an explanation for the placebo effects. Neurons in the periaqueductal gray matter release neurotransmitters called endorphins, which have a similar effect to opioids in terms of their action on pain stimuli. Endorphins decrease sensitivity to pain stimuli on the posterior horn neurons. The pain input is still present and its intensity is unaffected. The CNS neurons perceive the pain as being less intense or even absent. And this is another example of the cell-cell communication core principle. Okay, phantom limb pain occurs after amputation of a limb or some extremity. The patients perceive that the body part is still present and functional even though there's no sensory input and a tiny percentage develop phantom pain in the missing part. It's difficult to treat due to the complex way the central nervous system processes pain and it supports the idea that the somatosensory cortex has a map of the body that is independent of the peripheral nervous system. Over time, this map will rearrange itself so the body is represented accurately and the phantom sensations will decrease. Basically, this is pain that's generated within the nervous system itself independent of um, sensory receptor input to the PNS. The special senses include vision, hearing, which is termed audition, taste, which is termed gustation, smell, which is termed olfaction, and balance, which is vestibular sensation. Each involves neurons that detect, and st detect a stimulus and send it to the central nervous system so that it can be processed and integrated. Remember that the thalamus is the gateway for the entry of special sensory stimuli into the cerebral cortex. It interprets the majority of this information with the exception being olfactory information. The pathways for processing each type of special sensory stimuli for visual. The stimuli are sent directly to the thalamus, then relayed to the primary visual cortex, which then processes the stimuli and perceives an object's depth, color, and detects rapid changes in stimuli. So the, the receptors are termed photoreceptors and they're found in the retina. The optic nerve relays this information from the retina through the optic chiasm, which is where the two optic nerves cross just in front of the pituitary gland, and then the optic tracts radiate back to the thalamus, which then radiates back to the occipital lobe. The information is shared with association areas in the temporal and parietal lobes, and this is crucial for object recognition and spatial awareness. For auditory, the stimuli first go to nuclei in the brain stem where limited processing occurs. The majority of the stimuli are rooted to the thalamus and then the primary auditory cortex, which is on the superior temporal lobe for sound processing. The information is then relayed to other association areas such as Wernicke's for language comprehension. Gustatory stimuli are sent to nuclei in the medulla before being laid to the thalamus, then sent to the gustatory cortices found in the insula and in the parietal lobes for processing. The information is then sent to the hypothalamus and limbic system, likely for processing of taste preferences and food-seeking behavior. 
olfactory route. The stimuli enter the limbic system of the cerebral cortex for initial processing, bypassing the thalamus. They're then sent to several regions of the brain, including the thalamus, the prefrontal cortex, the hypothalamus, and limbic system components. And this allows smell to influence behaviors such as emotion, cognition, and those related to feeling. Balance is processed by vestibular apparatus in the inner ear. This involves several brainstem nuclei, the cerebellum, and descending pathways through the spinal cord as well as pathways through the thalamus and to the cerebral cortex. Okay, one of the things that happens once, once we first have sensation and then perception and then integration of stimulus is that we route that information to the frontal lobe and then we generate a plan of action based on that incoming stimulus. So what we're looking at now is how these plans are produced and then sent to their effector organs so that we can carry out these plans of action. Planning and coordination of voluntary movement are carried out within the central nervous system and they involve motor areas of the cerebral cortex, the basal nuclei, the cerebellum, and the spinal cord. Three types of neurons are directly involved in eliciting a muscle contraction. Upper motor neurons with cell bodies in the motor area of the cerebral cortex or brainstem have axons that descend through the cerebral white matter to the brainstem and spinal cord and then synapse with local inner neurons, which then pass messages from upper motor neurons to lower motor neurons. The cell bodies of lower motor neurons are in the anterior horn of the spinal gray matter. The axons exit the central nervous system in order to innervate skeletal muscle. Okay? So again, what we see here is that motor information is going to exit via the ventral root this will then become part of a spinal nerve if this is happening in the, uh, the regions that are served by the spinal cord. And then ultimately these axons will head all the way to their target where they will induce action as a result of the release of neurotransmitter. Axons from the cortical motor areas unite to form several white matter tracts. The largest are the corticospinal tract, which controls muscles below the head and neck using lower motor neurons of spinal nerves. The corticonuclear tract, which was formerly known as the corticobulbar tract, which controls muscles of the head and neck utilizing lower motor neurons for, of cranial nerves. So let's take a look at the corticospinal tract. Again, notice that these pathways are named for where they start and where they stop. In the corticospinal pathway, axons that form the corticospinal tracts originate from upper motor neuron cell bodies in the primary motor and premotor cortices. These axons unite and descend through the corona radiata and internal capsule on the way to the brain stem, passing the midbrain and the pons. Most of these fibers decussate at the medullary pyramids Thus, neurons on the right side of the brain send fibers to the left side of the body and vice versa. Fibers that cross travel in the lateral funiculi. These are known as the right and left lateral corticospinal tracts. Fibers of the lateral corticospinal tracts synapse on local inner neurons in the anterior horn of the spinal gray matter. Over half terminate in the cervical spinal cord to control motor functions of the upper limb. 10 to 15 percent of motor fibers uh, from the cerebrum do not cross over. They travel through the anterior funiculi of the spinal white matter and become the right and left anterior corticospinal tracts. So again, we can run a trace. So we'll do that. Let's use blue here. Okay. So the upper motor neurons are going to um, generate the motor plan of action, all right? And that's going to involve uh, planning and forethought, and eventually the finalized plan of action is sent to the precentral gyrus, which is the posterior border of the frontal lobe, 
and that information is going to drop down from the cortical gray matter and descend through the internal capsule past the midbrain and the majority of these fibers are going to cross over at the level of the medulla oblongata okay now what happens next is that these upper motor neurons are going to head all the way down to the lower motor neurons and they will synapse there okay in interneurons in the anterior horn right so we're going to head over here and we're going to synapse here and then let's switch colors we'll do black the lower motor neurons will carry the information ultimately to the target okay now what we have here is a very fast pathway and the reason for that is the fact that there are few synapses and we've got high speed fibers here, high speed neuronal fibers. Okay. Um, <coughs> meaning that <coughs> they have a high degree of myelination and they are wide. Okay. So these guys run about 200 miles an hour. And that's important because we don't want there to be much of a delay between when we generate a plan of action and when we execute it in order to enhance our chances for survival. Okay? The corticonuclear tracts originate from cell bodies of the upper motor neurons and travel with the corticospinal tracts through the corona radiata and the internal capsule to the brainstem. They do not enter the spinal cord and instead synapse on interneurons that communicate with cranial nerve nuclei at various levels of the brainstem. The cranial nerve nuclei give rise to the lower motor neurons that innervate the muscles of the head and the neck. The fibers do not decussate, but most cranial nerve nuclei communicate with upper motor neurons from both cerebral hemispheres. As a result, damage to upper motor neurons on one side of the cerebrum does not lead to noticeable deficits from many cranial nerves. Even simple movements require simultaneous firing of many neurons as part of a selected group of actions called a motor program. Execution of any motor program requires firing of neurons in motor association areas, the firing of upper motor neurons in input from basal nuclei, cerebellum, and spinal cord, as well as multimodal association areas found in the prefrontal cortex and the sensory areas. The firing of lower motor neurons in the peripheral nervous system is necessary in order to complete the task. So here we see the precentral gyrus and the motor homunculus. If we look at the cerebral cortex, the majority of upper motor neurons that control complex movement reside in the primary motor cortex and the premotor and motor association areas. They plan and initiate voluntary movement by selecting an appropriate motor program and coordinating a sequence of skilled movements. The upper motor neurons are also located in certain nuclei of the brainstem and work to maintain posture, balance, and body position, especially during movement, such as locomotion. They also produce motor responses to sensory stimuli, a map of upper motor neurons in the primary motor cortex and the motor homunculus, resemble the sensory homunculus. The primary motor cortex is organized somatotopically. Certain body regions have disproportionately more cortical area devoted to them, especially the lips, the tongue, and the hands, and this signifies the importance of vocalization and manual dexterity to our survival. Upper motor neurons do not act alone when delivering commands to lower motor neurons. Smooth fluid motion requires input from the basal nuclei and the cerebellum. So what we have here 
is a communication network that's set up between where we generate the plan of action which is in the frontal lobe where we send the finalized plan of action which is the precentral gyrus and then how we make certain that our plan of action is being carried out by comparing our intended movements with our actual movements and so the role of, of editing our movement if they don't if our attentions and our actions don't match falls to the cerebellum and the basal nuclei and what they do is they compare the actual finalized motor plan that they receive as the pathways descend through the brain stem and ultimately to the spinal cord to sensory information from things like the eyes and the vestibular apparatus and the proprioceptive apparatus to what we're to what we're planning to do okay and if the actual movements and the intended movements don't sync what will happen is that the basal nuclei and the cerebellum will edit that plan send it back to the precentral gyrus and then the edited plan will be executed the basal nuclei are three collections of cell bodies that make up um, the caudate nucleus, the globus pallidus, and the putamen. These are deep pockets of gray matter within the white matter of the brain. They have many interconnections that form a circuit between the basal nuclei and other structures of the brain. The substantia nigra, so named because of its dark color, is found in the midbrain and works with the basal nuclei. They're often grouped together because of their shared function. The basal nuclei modify the activity of upper motor neurons to produce voluntary movements and inhibit involuntary ones. A critical function of the basal nuclei is to inhibit inappropriate movement. In the absence of voluntary movement, neurons in the pallidus fire continuously to inhibit motor nuclei in the thalamus, and this inhibits upper motor neurons of the cortical motor areas from firing. Okay. What we're looking at here is just a, a graphic illustrating how voluntary movement is initiated and then executed. So everything begins in the, in the uh, cerebral cortex in the frontal lobe. What will happen is that we will hatch a plan of action and then um, that information will be um, funneled to the caudate nucleus and the putamen as well as the substantia nigra and the globus pallidus and what these will do is essentially coordinate the movements and then send the finalized plan of action to the precentral gyrus which will then send information um, down via the upper motor neurons to the lower motor neurons and the result will be the execution of action. Note that the globus pallidus inhibits the thalamus in the absence of input from the caudate nucleus and the putamen. The thalamus does not stimulate upper motor neurons so that inappropriate movement is inhibited. Okay, so very important that we understand that the the subcortical gray matter is responsible for coordinating the movement and making it fluid. The cerebellum is going to receive a copy of this plan of action that's sent to the precentral gyrus so that it can compare our planned movements with our actual movements. And then the upper motor neurons are going to drop that information down to the lower motor neurons and then we will execute the movement. If we have damage to the subcortical gray matter, what will happen is that movements will be uncoordinated and often purposelessness. You might think of this um, as a lot of noise in the movement with very little um, directed intentional action. The basal nuclei are important in initiation of voluntary movement. If voluntary movement has been initiated, neurons of the caudate nucleus and the putamen get input from the cerebral cortex, which they then form excitatory synapses in order to relay. These neurons inhibit the globus pallidus neurons from firing, 
it, this is enhanced by the substantia nigra. These are largely dopaminergic neurons. And this increases the output of the caudate nucleus and the putamen. The overall effect is that the inhibitor, the globus pallidus, is inhibited. And this allows the motor nuclei of the thalamus to fire and stimulate upper motor neurons of the cerebral cortex. And this is what's going to enable the motion. Neurons of the substantia nigra project to the caudate nucleus and the putamen where dopamine enhances inhibitory output to the globus pallidus. The input of the substantia nigra is vital for initiating movement and you've probably heard again of a condition in which the dopaminergic neurons are destroyed and this is a condition known as Parkinson's disease and what happens as a result is it's very difficult for the individuals that lose this neural tissue to initiate voluntary movement. So again, we're seeing the flow here, the role of the basal nuclei in voluntary movement. Again, it all begins with the cerebral cortex and the substantia nigra, which stimulate the caudate nucleus and the putamen, which inhibit the globus pallidus, which can no longer inhibit the thalamus. The thalamus then allows the upper motor neurons to send input to the lower motor neurons and then movement is initiated. Damage to any component of the basal nuclei results in a movement disorder. There's two main forms. The inability to initiate voluntary movement, making simple activities such as walking or talking difficult if not impossible. The ability to inhibit inappropriate movement, some of which are mild and others which may be severe enough to cause disability. So again, what we're looking at here is the flow, okay? So let's let's start on the right-hand side of the diagram with voluntary movement taking place, right? The cerebral cortex is going to um, receive a plan of action from the frontal lobe. The cerebral cortex and substantia nigra stimulate the caudate nucleus and the putamen, which inhibit the globus pallidus. Thus, the globus pallidus can no longer inhibit the thalamus. As a result, the thalamus can stimulate the upper motor neurons, and the upper motor neurons can then project down to the lower motor neurons, and they will head out to the effectors, and the movement will be executed. Okay. Normally, if we're not um, initiating voluntary movement, the globus pallidus inhibits the thalamus in the absence of input from the caudate nucleus and the putamen, and no movement takes place. Okay, so this subcortical gray matter is critical again in signal processing. As we already noted, white matter is for signal transmission, gray matter is for signal processing. Okay, now what does the cerebellum do? Well, we talked about the fact that basically the cerebellum's job is to make certain that our intentions match our actions. The cerebellum monitors ongoing movement and integrates information such as contraction and relaxation of muscles, position of joints and direction of force, and the type of movement that's going to occur. Once the information is integrated, the cerebellum determines motor error, which is the differential between the intended and the actual movement that's taking place. The cerebellum then influences other regions of the brain to reduce this error. This can occur over both short and long term by a process called motor learning. The corrections for the motor error are added over time to the motor program. More repetition of the specific action results in more correction for motor error and this results in more fluid and error-free motion. Okay, so again, the role is basically to make sure that our intentions and our actions sync up. The cerebellum receives input from three sources at the same time. It gets information from the motor areas of the cerebral cortex through upper motor neurons. It gets vestibular information from the nuclei in the pons. And it gets ascending sensory tracts that bring in information from the spinal cord. And so a lot of this is proprioceptive information. So you can see by having balance information, 
and prior receptive information and visual information and there's special, other special senses that go into this as well that we can compare our actual movements to our intended movements and then correct them in the event that they don't sync up.